what builds an adaptive and resilient immune system is the biodiversity of bacteria in your gut, where your body builds antibodies to all kinds of things, raw milk, kefir, raw milk, raw butter, cream cheese, all these things and bioactives, and meat, and whole foods, and all these whole food things together feed the bacterial diversity in your gut, keep things alive well and adaptive and builds that mucosal lining in the intestines which is so important in terms of protecting us mark welcome to the meat mafia podcast this is uh an absolute pleasure to have you on the show uh long time coming so really appreciate you joining us today excellent excellent I'm glad to be here we're excited. I was saying um, before we hit record, this is a special podcast for both of us because I think for many people um, that don't know you, you are the founder of Raw Farm, which is the world's largest um, organic raw dairy farm in the world. And when I was living in San Diego and Harry would come out to visit me, we were starting to hear a lot more about raw milk. We had both experimented with a carnivore diet. We had a lot of success with it. But as you know, milk is a very polarizing topic. So a lot of people that are pushing you to go carnivore, they're telling you to get off of dairy products. And the more research we were doing, we were hearing that raw forms of dairy are some of the most bioactive, nutrient-dense foods you could possibly be eating, but we didn't know where to get it. And luckily in California, you're able to get your product in Sprouts, in Erewhon, and a couple of the local grocery stores out there. So we actually, your product was the first raw milk product that we've ever consumed and we've never looked back since. So number one, we just wanted to thank you for doing the work that you're doing. And we're just so excited to dig into everything with you today because it's such an important topic. It's been a life's purpose and passion of mine for the last 25 years. So thank you for that. There's mm -hmm. a lot of story behind why I'm so passionate and driven to do this when the forces are so heavy against us. But uh, I've often said, you know, they may have the guns and the money, but I've got the truth of the mom. So there you go. <laughs> Before we get into it, I, I just need to get this off my mind because I'm literally <laughs> dreaming about one of the products that you guys have. The I think it's a kefir with cinnamon in it. Oh, my God. It's, <laughs> it's, it's so good. Yeah, it's insane. It's really good. No added sugar. It's just got some various different uh, herbs in, in, in it, you know, and it's just fermented raw milk that's fermented, you know, with... Uh, 12 additional bacteria on top of the hundreds of random bacteria that are always occurring in raw milk. And they're taken to literally, you know, what is it, 40 million bacteria per milliliter. And everyone's different because of the way it's fermented. So it's truly rewilding your gut, which is the diversity needed to build an immune system, which is fantastic, and the food to feed it. Yeah, that's, we're going to, we're going to dig into it all. And it's, you know, you don't know this, Mark. So we're, we live in Austin, Texas now. Um, we both went to college together. We played college baseball together up in Boston. So before we launched the brand, which we really feel is our life's work, I was living in New York City working a job. Harry was in Boston in corporate America as well. And it's fascinating when you go to these Northeast cities and probably even some, some more left-leaning cities in California as well. When you go to a coffee shop, the baristas literally say, do you want cow's milk or plant-based milk? And there are so many millennials and people in general that are drinking plant-based milk, thinking it's healthier, not realizing that conventional almond milk, oat milk, et cetera, it's like 15 chemical ingredients, seed oils, rapeseed oil, et cetera, versus like drinking a product that's actually created by God. So I'm just curious, just to start things off, what is your like reaction to that when you see this world of, do you want cow's milk or plant milk? I wrote up interesting little multi-page uh, story. Oh, it's been 15, 17 years ago. It said, all of the things that pasteurization has killed. Mm. And it was like 12 things. It was, it was really amazing. Now I, I've come up with a couple more things, but one of them was um, the delicious flavor, taste, and the drive for milk was one of the things that pasteurization, because it's so allergenic, So hard to die, excusing filth. And to quote Dr. Bruce German, the pasteurization is an 18th century solution to an 18th century problem. We can do so much better. So by putting in all these rules and regulations that list, literally excused filthy milk in the 1800s and made that the standard of identity for milk, people don't appreciate a, a flavorless or, or bad tasting, allergenic, hard to digest food. Um, 
and, and are rejecting it. So raw milk was not available as a, as a supplement or as a replacement for that. So what would they do? They, they're doing everything but milk. And so they have all these emerging uh, new products, soy milk, almond milk, uh, macadamia milk. I mean, every kind of milk you'd imagine, which basically trying to lubricate their cereal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they missed the real thing, which is raw milk. And so when you've got 10 or 15 years of people, 20 years, maybe pushing, pushing into this alternatives of milk thing, finding that it is filled with all this crap that you never want to put your body built in the lab. And then you recognize that that doesn't do anything for me either. It's associated with all kinds of issues and problems. It doesn't taste very good. And you discover raw milk that's low risk or safe, delicious, fantastic, delivered to the store quickly. The people start immediately going, whoa, this is fantastic. And they move on beyond the milk alternatives, which they were forced to go to because pasteurization was such a, 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 a bad choice. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's going on. That's my, my kind of my initial response. Remember that these milk alternatives do not have the thousands of bioactives found in raw milk. Those bioactives are put there by Mother Nature's blueprint and God himself through a million years of evolution to make sure that a baby thrived thrived at its weakest point in life at birth. When it didn't have an immune system, raw colostrum, then raw milk built one in the microbiome of the gut, which allowed it to deal with viruses and bacteria and build the biodiversity of, 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 you know, of all the biodiversity in the gut. And then the antibodies, all the wonderful diversity of antibodies to be able to protect themselves against all the onslaughts. And so, Breastfeeding is raw milk, guys. And what's interesting about that is breast milk is raw milk from mammals, and it's uncontested as the perfect food by the FDA, USDA, World Health Organization, all the physicians organizations. Everybody that's anybody says breastfeed your babies, please, please, because all these fantastic benefits. But if you move from breast milk to cows, goats, sheep, horses, reindeer, camels, they freak out. And that's the big paradigm here is we can do a good job of producing safe raw milk. Uh, Dr. Henry Coit did it in 1893. He said, just clean up the milk and test it and have it come from cows on pastures and have it come from places that have clean water. Mm. And that was out in the countryside. But in 1893, also, uh, you know, Nathan Strauss brought in the parboiler from uh, from from France to cook the hell out of the milk because the filthy sources of milk in the downtown city brewery dairies was filled with typhoid and all kinds of crap was killing 50% of the people that drank it. So you had kind of diversion of the paths in 1893. And we are the manifest destiny of Dr. Henry Coit's work from the 1890s that had been going back down back for 15,000 years before that. So uh, this is really, really, I think that when people say, oh, raw milk's a fad, you know, uh, 15,000 year fat and I love it. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about like just starting from the top, like pasteurization versus raw milk? When did we have to start making that distinction? Because at, at a certain point, raw milk just used to be everything. Like like you said, mm. uh, there were we didn't have the technology to pasteurize milk. We hadn't thought about it because it wasn't a problem. So oh. when did we have to start making this distinction? We, the scientists, the archaeologists, and, and the, the medical uh, investigators at the science, uh, science level have found residues of lactose sugars in vases going back 13 to 15,000 years ago in cave dwellers in Europe and in you know, various parts of the world. So think about yourself as a man and a woman and, and a child and, and families or a group of people. They were trying to survive. These people were starving. I mean, it was hard to thrive and survive without readily available food sources. You were always trying to hunt or fish or farm or gather or do something to eat. So gathering food and eating was the principal, most important thing along with shelter. And if you could capture yourself a mammal, whichever one that was, that lactated, that made milk, a donkey, a horse, uh, any kind of a, a lactating mammal, and you captured it and put it on some pa a pasture or grass and you had clean water and sunshine, you had food today. And you could suckle directly from that teat of that animal, which I've seen pictures of uh, in India and in Africa and, and even Mongolia. Uh, that infant, that child, that family thrived. And you could collect milk into that gourd, which was not clean, by the way, it was dirty. 
And that dirt was actually the cultures from last week's milk and that last week's uh, residues, the cultures, the bacterial cultures inoculated the milk and made kefir literally within 24 hours by fermentation naturally. And that kefir would have a very long shelf life of 60, 90 days just sitting in a warm environment. And if you strain that kefir, it became kef uh, a kefir cheese or natural farmer's cheese. So it was really, really important for people to be able to have this portable uh, source of food to not die, to not, you know, have a problem, to struggling. And so for many, many, I mean, for the millennia, mankind's been doing this in, in Africa, in Asia, in, in Mongolia, they've been doing it. In Northern Europe, all through Europe, Mediterranean. As goat, sheep, horse, the archaeologists and the medical investigators said that it was probably one of the most important uh, things that has occurred in history for mankind to thrive and to have a competitive advantage, as they said. So that said, let's go through all the Roman ages through, you know, Jesus Christ himself. What would what would Jesus drink? It was milk, of milk, uh, land of milk and honey was not pasteurized. That's for damn sure. And we have been really, really, really closely associated with our our cows, goat, sheep, and cohabitating with them and share a much of a genome with them. The genetics that we have are very similar in, in terms of the bacterial uh, uh, collaborations, the commensal and communal um, uh, kinds of things we did together was very closely associated. So we didn't have problems with that. Bring it now to the, uh, let's say 1700s, 1800s. People were bringing cows to America. In fact, all the pilgrims went back to Europe before the arrival of the first cow. It was literally one of the things that allow us to sustain ourselves here. Now, the Indians didn't drink raw milk. At least there's no evidence they did. But they ate raw organs all day long. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so organ meats have the raw fats necessary to have the fat-soluble vitamins to thrive. So, uh, you know, Europeans were not really into eating raw liver and raw heart and raw adrenal glands. Uh, we were more into the raw milk. It was very convenient. But nonetheless... The same ingredients were found in those things. Uh, that said, in 1893, there was something called the milk problem. In fact, there's lots written about it. The milk problem identified the fact that there was major problems by bringing the cows into the cities from where they were before out in the countryside where they had fresh water and pastures and sunshine. And everybody, every, every other house had a cow. Out in the countryside, it was part of life. You had a cow and a musket, or you died, right? Um, and the bottom line was they brought these cows into the city. Well, in the city, they didn't have fresh water. They certainly didn't have pastures. And the cows were housed in these buildings that were being the cows were being fed brewers distillers grains. And when you get brewers distillers grains, it's not a nutrient dense product at all. In fact, its nutrients have been depleted from it because you're making brewery, you know, making alcohol from it. And the, the water was filthy, and the people milking the cows by hand were not well themselves. They, a lot of them had uh, tuberculosis, and there's typhoid fever, and all kinds of horrible things going on there. And so the milk, if you think about a cold morning when you're milking uh, 100 cows with, by hand, you'd put your feet in the milk. Well, I don't know anybody's feet that's particularly clean. So the bottom line is because it was cold. That milk was killing 50% of people that drank it. It was disgusting. And I'm the first to say it was disgusting. And so the remedy was either cook it and that solved some of the problem because you still had dirty water and the dirty water caused a lot of problems. So uh, they didn't have the clean water from out the countryside with free flowing, uh, you know, creeks and rivers. It was the filthy water inside cities with no fleshy toilets and just filth everywhere. So there was that pathway of divergence where you had Dr. Henry Coit saying the American Association of Medical Milk Commissions of the AAMMA had certified raw milk actually supervised by, supervised by physicians in the countryside, that milk was going to the Mayo Clinic to heal people. It was clean, raw milk that was wonderful. And then you got the filthy milk that was being cooked. And of course, that was the industrial solution, right? That was the way to make filthy okay or relatively okay. Well, over time, and especially in World War II, that won out in the 30s and 40s when America, let's think about the Depression. Nobody had any money and you needed cheap, cheap food. Well, in the 1930s, that was the solution. Just whatever milk you got, just cook the hell out of it. You're good to go. And nobody was considering or thinking about the bioactives or the bioavailability or the nutrient content of their food. Remember, in World War II, we were thinking about DDT was good for your skin, smoking was good for your lungs, and nuclear bombs solved social problems. You know, 
So that was kind of the mindset where pasteurized milk started to win. And there were a lot of lies told about raw milk because the certified raw milk people were thriving, but their milk was more expensive. And the big processors couldn't go get that milk and do their processing with it. They had to, uh, you know, go to the, the farms, pick up the milk, and then that milk is commingled together with other farms. It had to be cooked because you couldn't control the, the value or the, or the quality or the safety of it. So by the 1950s and 60s, you started dying off. A lot of the raw milk was dying off. And you saw the cheap milk prevailing. And the last certified raw milk, the AAMM certified, MMC certified milk was Altadena Dairy in Los Angeles in 1999. So it lasted about 106 years and died off. That's where we picked up. That's where the Raw Milk Institute started uh, establishing the same standards, similar to AAMMC, but a little different, a little more advanced. And then obviously we picked up on that marketplace in Los Angeles where people were didn't have any raw milk from the uh, certified raw milk people at Altadena. And so we picked up on that and ran off to the races. And now by building a strong brand and awareness of the science, because I attend the International Milk Genomics Consortium conferences, uh, UC Davis professors that actually study this stuff and look at lactation, look at mammalian milk, breast milk, all kinds of milk. And I'm the only farmer in the room at these uh, conferences every year. And I take that science and I apply it to what we're doing on the food safety side, on the nutrient density side, and on the education side, on the podcast uh, side with the meat mafia here. And what do you know? People become aware, especially what? post-COVID, what builds your immune system? It's not a shot in the arm. That sucker is it's short-lived, and it's good for last year's flu about a third of the time. So what builds an adaptive and resilient immune system is the biodiversity of bacteria in your gut, where your body builds antibodies to all kinds of things versus just what you got a shot for, right? And so it is the adaptive, resilient immune system put here by Mother Nature's blueprint to protect mankind on earth, that's now the blueprints of people saying, wait a minute, raw milk, kefir, raw milk, raw butter, cream cheese, all these things, bioactives, and meat, and whole foods, and all these whole food things together feed the bacterial diversity in our gut, keep things alive, well, and adaptive, and builds that mucosal lining in the intestines, which is so important in terms of protecting us. So that's the short course on 15,000 years ago to today. And it's really, really interesting that people are thriving. They're the ones that don't get the flu. They're the ones that have kids in daycare that don't get sick. Or if they do, it's very short because their, their bodies immediately react to a, a, an antibody. They make an antibody. And the ear infection rates are much lower. Asthma gets decreased. Uh, the flu, colds, all that stuff is dramatically reduced. And kids are thriving. That's the truth of farmers over pharmacies. And the, the FDA is really pissed off right now because... They want everybody to rely on their pharmaceutical relationships to get the drugs to recover from uh, disease and illness instead of protecting against it uh, and inc increasing your ability to, to deal with a chronic inflammation uh, with anti-inflammatory foods like raw milk. Uh, they're, they're wanting to fix it with a pharmaceutical solution. So this is a revolution occurring as we speak to education and influencers saying, guys, there's a better way. Hmm. Mark, there's, that is so well said. There's so much information to unpack in that statement that you just made. But I think, I think the biggest thing that I'm pulling from you is that when it comes to understanding frameworks around food, really looking back and knowing history is so incredibly important because I think one of the conclusions that Harry and myself have formed is that, to your point, meat and milk are very similarly bastardized. So where we started was understanding the demonization around saturated fat because we had gone carnivore started eating all the foods that conventional doctors were telling us not to eat. Those are the foods that really allowed us to heal. Harry ended up buying us two copies of the book, The Untold Story of Milk by Ron <laughs> Schmidt. So that's when we had learned about swill milk and th a lot of the historical events that you just talked about. And so a lot of these policies that are still in place around food, our aversion to raw milk, our aversion to saturated fat, this is an extension of things that occurred 50 to 100 plus years ago that are still in place. And what you're saying is that instead of Pastor, pasteurizing this swill milk, what if you actually just create milk uh, in relationship to God and build relationships directly with those farmers, and then you don't need to pas pasteurize it, and then you're getting all these amazing nutrients and bioactive ingredients like you're talking about that you're not going to get in pasteurized milk. Right, you're exactly right. You are exactly right.
but uh, you have to really recognize and this is this this is a, a worthy foe this is a worthy freaking fight here guys the fda is so connected to establishments in terms of the money making machines around pharmaceuticals in my opinion if i was secretary of agriculture for a week I would immediately strip all responsibility of the FDA for any food whatsoever. Keep them in charge of, of drugs and, and pharmaceuticals and medical stuff. That's great. Let them be experts in that. Take that food and put it under the USDA. Put some dirt under it and make sure that it is food. It's where the beef is. That's where the eggs are. That's where the, the, the vegetables are. That's and, and let that be where our food is regulated. Right now, the association with the Food, Drugs, and Cosmetic Act, for instance, which is an FDA regulation, where I can't even speak on our own uh, social platforms about food as medicine. I cannot bring forth any of the science that's done in Europe. And I'm talking about hundreds of studies done in the last 20 years about the medical benefits, the health benefits, the healing benefits of raw milk. I can't even bring forward breast milk. I can't correlate science. We've spent billions of dollars investigating and food because that creates a new drug because only drugs cure under our current policy. So that worthy foe is extremely well indoctrinated into policy. And we can't do the farmers over pharmacies thing except on a podcast like your own, which are not talking about uh, my brand per se. We're talking about raw milk uh, and I'm not promoting me. I'm talking we. Uh, and we really have to kind of be strong enough, stand up and, and say, no, the truth is important for people and not the processors. And that's where really, I mean, this is a battle. And I, I'm 63 years old. My son's 40. My, my grandsons are, you know, seven to 10, 12, uh, 14 years old now, 13 years old. This is going to be a battle we're going to have for generations to buy back and bring back and, and, and actually literally dollar vote back customers saying no, saying I want this instead of that to change policy and change direction of our medical community. Because right now I am, I was a paramedic for 17 years. So I am very familiar with medical problems, but we need good, strong medicine. Absolutely. We need good trauma centers when we get shot or car accidents or burned. But when it comes to chronic disease processes, we must redirect ourselves to nutrition in the gut microbiome. The science says that our immune systems are 85% in our gut microbiome. But yet 24,000 people a year, plus or minus 1,000, depending on the year, die from the flu. Mm. I'm sorry. I don't know anybody that drinks raw milk dies from the flu. It doesn't just, I don't know, it's very rare if it does. The bottom line is, where is our adaptive and resilient immune systems? And that's what our customers and that's what our people are wanting, and they're getting it because it's the truth. And the truth always, always prevails. It just takes time because of the stickiness the stickiness of that regulatory thing, which says this is the only way forward. And if you don't, then you're, you're illegal. That regulatory framework has to change. And that's going to take some time and a little bit of education and some battle. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the regulatory aspect of raw milk is just, I feel like, continuing to enter the mainstream conversation in food. It's really cool to see that you know more and more people are coming around to the idea of food sovereignty and food freedom and that you know, high quality food can be used as medicine. But one of the things that I found really interesting as Brett and I started to explore raw milk, we wanted to connect with people who are actually producing. So we went out to um, a town outside of Austin uh, to the Jersey Barnyard, which is like an hour outside of Austin. The owners, Ralph and Faith, have been multi-generational raw dairy farm. Um, they've got a bunch of Jersey cows out there. And we're just asking them, you know, what is what are your customers getting from this milk? And they started going deep into the healing powers of raw milk and how raw milk has helped a lot of people with autoimmune issues, gut issues, um, skin problems, uh, even like diabetes, reverse some of these long, long medical prescriptions that uh, medicine couldn't figure out a problem for. So it was really powerful. And, and I think that just hearing their stories about the healing power of raw milk was incredible. And it really started to turn a lot of gears for me. So I'm curious, what do you, what do you attribute to that healing power of raw milk? And what, what should people know about raw milk as a, a healing agent versus pasteurized? Like why, why isn't pasteurized milk viewed in the same light as this healing source um, when it comes to all these autoimmune issues? 
man, there's a lot of meat on that bone to talk about, literally. <laughs> um, 2022, there was a study done by the Milk Process Association, the people who actually uh, process milk in America. And the study was all about the things they wanted to take out of raw milk and make into a new patented pill potion or product. And there were hundreds of these bioactive compounds, these proteins, these functional proteins, lactoferrin, alkaline phosphatase, peptidases, proteases, lipases, all these really, the raw whey protein, probably the most fam famous of all of them, that are destroyed by heat. They're de deactivated by heat. They're no longer bioactive. They're no longer biologically functional. They're destroyed. They're, they're no longer, they're, they're inert. Um, those bioactives drive how we operate in our gut and how we operate in our bodies designed by God himself in terms of the infinite, literally the infinite interactions between a food and your body physiologically. Now, when you consider that those bioactives are destroyed, but yet the processing industry identifies them as incredibly important to take out and at great expense, they want to take these out individually and concentrate them as a food. That is a mistake because the way these bioactives work is in the matrix of the whole. They interact with everything else, the raw fats, the proteins, the sugars, all these things together in their exact proportions and their exact interactions, which are infinite. Literally, you, you can't you can never enumerate the number of interactions going on. Uh, it's just um, blow your mind. It's like trying to count all the sand on a, on a beach. It's impossible. So that said, when you take all that together, that's raw milk. And that's what causes these uh, anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, pro-immune system, um, anti-hypertensive, uh, anti-asthma, anti-allergies. It stabilizes mast cells. So histamines are released. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. You take all that and you, you make it inert. Now you drink pasteurized milk and all you've got is a sugar and a protein that's been denatured. Sometimes that just fuels the bacteria in your gut, which are not healthy for you. You have some issues with all kinds of stuff going on there. And you don't put in the beneficial bacteria that need to compete in part of that matrix of the life, that diversity of bacteria, which inhabit your gut. You're not bringing new stuff in. All you're doing is feeding with sugars and proteins, those things are already there and they're not bioactive. So you've got a real problem at a physiological level going on when consuming pasteurized milk, which has basically been denuded and denatured and no longer vital versus something that's alive and well. Now the FDA will say all day long, there's no difference between the protein levels of raw milk and pasteurized milk. They're absolutely right. They're absolutely right. We don't change the protein levels. We change the living nature of the protein. The fact that it has an enzyme that coupling it, the enzymes are not, excuse me, the proteins are not denatured. They're functional. They are building blocks that are ready to go. They have enzymes working with them. They've got their proteases with their proteins. They've got all these things going on. That's what we're talking about. They refuse to go there because all they're saying is, oh, this vitamin or that protein are the same levels or they're not. No, that's not what we're talking about. They've missed the boat. And they've done that intentionally, by the way, because they don't want to go where I'm going. They don't want to go where the physiological activity of that product really makes a difference in your gut and, and in your life and in your health. And that's why you see stories like, I had Crohn's disease because I was eating all this American crap and taking all these drugs. They were turning off some of the signs and symptoms as the underlying disease process continued. And I'm two or three weeks from having surgery to have my intestines removed or part of my intestines and have an ileostomy tube and, 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 and poop in a plastic bag. And I, do, I didn't do this, but a friend of mine um, Google, what do I do to build an immune system and decrease inflammation in my gut? And they found out that raw milk and raw milk kefir and whole food nutrition, if given an opportunity over a period of <clears throat> three to six months, cures Crohn's and irritable bowel. Mm. Well, interesting enough, I've got at least 10 examples of people that have done that, where the doctor said, nutrition does not matter. Take our drugs, and if it doesn't work, we'll just take you surgery to fix it. They have an economic vested interest in that, guys. They have an economic vested interest 
to do surgeries on people's intestines and have them poop in a plastic bag. No. The bottom line is farmers over pharmacies. And when you go about changing the gut microbiome background environment where there's no longer inflammation, then the ulcerization of, col of uh, colitis and, and uh, Crohn's goes away. You mm. don't have a choice. So uh, we've got many, many people that are delighted by the fact they no longer have irritable bowel syndrome, they don't have Crohn's disease. And those are severe conditions um, that, that have cured it with a whole food diet. And the raw fats and good fats and cholesterols are very, very healing. And they come from meat. And they come from raw fats in raw milk. The meat fats and raw fats are very similar, very similar. So long story short, I mean, we, we got stories of people with asthma that were on inhalers and their kids couldn't get near peanuts and all kinds of stuff. And after six months being on a raw milk kefir diet and eating avocados and olive oil, and all these wonderful Mediterranean foods, uh, Mediterranean diet type foods, they're running track and they don't have to take inhalers anymore off their corticosteroids. I mean, this story goes on and on and on about children that have no more ear infections, that had chronic ear infections and back-to-back -back antibiotics all the time and no longer having that problem. Their ears are clear. And when their parents go over the grapevine to come to Fresno to visit us, they don't have, their ears aren't plugged because they don't have inflammation and the altitude changes. We've got commercial pilots that said, you know, I also used, always used to have pressurization changes in my aircraft or the non-pressurized aircraft always had pressurization changes in there. But after drinking rum up, they no longer have that because their eustachian tubes are open and don't have inflammation. So I tell you, this story is deep. Even the divers, uh, people who do scuba diving have that same kind of experience with, uh, with um, internal ear infections and stuff. So this is real. This is serious. People experience, they tell me these stories. I don't tell these, these stories to them. They tell me these stories. These, these stories drive my passion, drive my purpose, especially when given my pre-med background and the fact that I saw 15,000 people, not all of them were in chronic problems, but not of acute trauma. But you see this coming through all the time from asthma, allergies. And the one thing I used to see on all my medical calls was you go into the house and somebody's having some medical crisis and there's no good food in the house. And there's always a big pile of medications besides their bed. But yet they're in crisis. So this is full full cycle for me personally. And I see such a humanitarian wave occurring that I just am surfing. I'm loving the fact that these people are so excited about the fact they can control their lives and go forward sustainably uh, through, through food as medicine versus a drug they have to take that has all these side effects that doesn't really cure the problem anyway. Yeah, you're, the passion that you have is contagious and it should give everyone that's listening hope because I think you're this incredible blend of someone that is like truly injecting your heart and soul into what you're doing and your farm truly is it's a it's a family run mission if you go to the raw farm website your daughter's working there or your yeah your daughter's working there your son's working there your son-in-law is working there that I think that's so cool and it's really this like sacred transaction to have customers like us that get to know their farmer like you on a first name basis and we cut out the middleman, we decentralize and we transact where you're working really hard to produce this product. We're giving you our hard, hard earned dollar. It's such a, it's a cool thing that so many people have lost. But like you had said, through the power of the internet, we're bringing that back. And also Mark, when you're speaking, it's almost making me realize that I think we almost need to do a full overhaul of the new nutritional facts that are on the back of a food product. Because yep. to your point, these governing bodies are so focused on purely macronutrient level. So you take pasteurized milk, you take raw milk, the calories are the same, the saturated fats, the same, the protein contents, the same, the sugar contents, the same, but what it doesn't show in the nu nutrition label are all these bioactives, all these nutrients, all these enzymes that you're talking about. And it makes, it almost makes me think like when we think about what the world should be and what the future of food should be, it should be that adequate nutrition label that shows you all of these things you're getting from raw milk or regenerative meat versus these conventional products. It's really a product of industrialization right. too, right? Like the, we're thinking about how can we get one specific vitamin in our body and we're ignoring the fact that, as you said perfectly, the matrix of life does not provide one single vitamin in isolation. It's providing it in a combination of different functions between multiple vitamins. So. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting that industrialization as a paradigm has just forced this way of thinking into like how we think about food. And 
I mean, there's so many tangents on what you just said. The fact that America is spending 26% of its GMP on medical care in 1961 and six percent, which is about probably where it should be. But I mean, we're sliding downhill bad. And it's a money-making paradigm also. So the more money it makes, the more it wants to need, it needs to, to stay alive. Um, and the probably the most radical thing that's happening is when you take money away from something so powerful, they scream and yell about it. They don't like it. Um, I don't know if you saw the news or not, but about a week and a half ago, HHS, the Health and Human Services of the FDA, they gave $176 billion to Moderna mm. to create a mRNA vaccine for avian flu. And that's the H pie, the whole um, cow flu thing. Mm. And I was so upset. I submitted a government accountability office complaint on the whistleblower thing because I have received a phone call from a dairyman in the United States, the Southwest, outside of California. But somebody who said on May 1st, his cows had come down with H pie. He talked to his vet. <clears throat> he had six cows come down, very loose, uh, yellowish stools, manure, diarrhea, uh, low milk production. They didn't die, but the, but the interesting thing was that the veterinarian said, just take those six cows out of your herd and they'll recover by themselves in two weeks with antibodies to it. They'll get over it. And what do you know? In two weeks, they did. But during that period of time, because this, this young man has a brand that sells milk on retail shelves, who knows? Hundreds, if not maybe thousands of people consumed some of this milk with these uh, HPI uh, viruses in it. But we know that HPI is not a a, a GI tract or foodborne disease process. It is a respiratory process. Respiratory, not GI. Nobody got sick. No complaints. Tasted delicious. Yes, he'd removed the cows out of the herd. However, before he caught the cows, it got in the milk. So some level of H5 was in the milk. Interesting enough, I got that phone call and I submitted uh, all kinds of information to the FDA immediately saying, guys, you need to look at this because it doesn't cause illness. Because I got I got the phone call after this had occurred on May 25th. So I submitted information to Dr. Prater at the FDA saying, guys, wake up, wake up. H. pi doesn't cause illness in humans. And you know that because the science says it. And here's a real life human experience with all these people. He didn't respond for three weeks. Then I wrote another email back to him saying, I'm concerned you're not reacting and responding to what I said. That was on Ju uh, June 3rd, uh, excuse me, July 3rd. And he responded saying, tell me more. Uh, I told him as much as I knew. He still hasn't responded since. And the interesting thing is now the state that this problem occurred in, they're denying it occurred. They're denying there was a problem because they don't want the social pressure of having had this happen and have it answer the questions that come about this. And meanwhile, the FDA has been pushing HPI or this highly pathogenic avian influenza, which is not hylopathic, by the way, in the media for the last six months. And so the science and real life experience is suppressed because of the forces at Moderna, literally, getting mm -hmm. their $176 million. And if you look at the Moderna, they were having a challenge because their income dropped substantially because they're no longer making COVID vaccination, making billions of dollars. So it's the sustain the sustainability of create a new crisis so you can fix a new crisis. And in this case, there was no crisis. There was no crisis to fix. It didn't occur. It has not occurred. There's been no illnesses from raw milk and H pie in the United States. Not one. Yet we're spending 176 million dollars on Moderna to create a vaccine nobody wants anyway. That's hmm. not even a basis for even taking. There's nobody dying. So this is the insanity and the entrenched politics of what's going on at the highest levels, or I should say the lowest levels, depending on how you look at it. Uh, so the truth needs to get out. The truth needs to, you know, the bioactives found in raw milk are very, very antiviral. That's why kids don't get viruses. They don't get flu and cold. And the European studies are so clear on that. So it's interesting that Consumers that would consume his milk now are consuming milk from cows that have antibodies for that milk in their, uh, for that uh, virus in their milk. And it's highly healing and protective. So Mother Nature's blueprints are being ignored, suppressed uh, in favor of pharmaceutical interests to make a bunch of money. And that's just so sad. So I just thought I'd tell that little story to you because it's breaking news to me. We're going to be on 
uh, probably tomorrow or the next day, uh, LA Times has a major breaking story on this where they came out and interviewed me and, and story is really going to be thick and deep with science and why this is growing the way it is. Wow. That's yeah, wow. Awesome. And it, and it really, it seems like this isn't a story that's in isolation. Like I, we had the strong sisters. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They, they uh, live in Michigan. They run a co-op called the nourish co-op and they were just, I think just last week, rated by the Michigan Department of Agriculture, threw away $90,000 worth of raw dairy products simply because the avian flu scare, um, the H5N1. So I'm curious to get your take on that a little bit more. Do you, like, what what do you think the real risk factors are with the bird flu? Do you think it's, or and what do you think the motives are for kind of pushing this fear out into the public, um, like, consciousness? like? Why? Why are? Why is this? Why are people getting raided for having raw dairy farms uh, during this time? Well, I'll start with the science. Um, Peg Coleman with Coleman Scientific is an ex USDA risk analysis and medical biologist, and she did a meta analysis, which is a study of all studies. Right, is looking at all the information available at PubMed and other archiving literature databases, and found that there was no evidence at all that this particular H5N1 virus lacked the genetic potential to make the jump to humans. And it was a virus that was actually communicated by uh, respiratory communication and transmission, not GI tract. It wasn't like norovirus, which can cause problems with the GI tract. It wasn't like that, it was different. Genomically, genetically, it was different. So the FDA knows this. Their scientists are very smart. But remember post COVID, they really, really beat up a big fear campaign on COVID. Now, I'm not saying that COVID didn't kill people. It did. It really did. It killed those that had compromised immune systems and poor health. That's who it killed. It weeded out the herd. Um, and everybody, even those that got vaccinated, and I unfortunately made the choice to become vaccinated. I had a, a Moderna vaccine myself. Being the old paramedic, I said, what the hell, let's do it. And I got, I got COVID. It wasn't severe, but I got COVID. Now, maybe it would have been worse if I didn't, but I know a lot of people that didn't get vaccinated, they had strong immune systems, they had no effect whatsoever from COVID. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they didn't have COVID at all. So bottom line is, there's a huge push and a momentum within the pharmaceutical industry. Once you funded the COVID vaccination and you created mRNA, uh, they are going to want a second wave, third wave, fourth wave. It's the new way that they can make money. So in my opinion, I think this whole Moderna thing is a perfect example of you created a large capacity organization. You have bigger paychecks to fill. You've had profits in the past. And now that's passed. How do you sustain that organization without another crisis? And so this was the classic, we need something to fix because we've got this big, big machine that fixed the last one in their minds. So our consumer base is saying, not again, not on my watch. We're not gonna do that to ourselves again. No way. The side effects of COVID vaccination, MRA are horrible. All kinds of people have had problems with that thing. It's not a natural process. It's not attenuated natural viruses. It's some lab manufactured spike protein thing that's crazy, crazy doing all kinds of stuff. So the people are saying no, and they're saying we want a natural process whereby we have an adaptive Im immune system in our gut. And they're studying it. These same PubMed articles are available for everybody to read and people can become smart. So there's a lot of real disconnect. And if you think about this, the FDA for the last six months without any basis whatsoever has been saying, don't drink raw milk, don't drink raw milk. And by the way, their pasteurized milk has had ton and tons and tons of avian flu in it because it's combined between a hundred different dairies together in one brand in a big cream silo. And yeah, pasteurization does denature most of that, that, that virus. I, I agree. However, even the active virus would not cause disease because the science says it. And now we have a dairy that sold this milk to a bunch of consumers unknowingly, it was accidental that doesn't, didn't cause any illness whatsoever. And the health department confirmed there was no illness whatsoever. So now we have the science. We also have a real life example of what happens when it happens, it happened in May, but the FDA suppresses that, doesn't acknowledge it, refuses to explore it, will not go out and do a mission to, 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 for a discovery to find out what the truth is. 
Instead, they send $176 million to their buddy over at Moderna so he can make his billion dollar pile high a little deeper. Um, and, and that, in my opinion, is lying to the people. And what's happening is the FDA has earned a reputation, has earned a reputation for not telling the truth, mm -hmm. for misleading. And when you mislead people, they don't tend to, it's like crying wolf, right? You do that repeatedly. After a while, people say, I don't think there is a wolf, guys. You've been crying wolf every time there isn't one. And therefore, I'm not going to listen to you now. And so people would rather listen to you guys, to Harry and Brett, than the FDA. Because your life experience is grounded in your own experiences and what you're doing. Uh, and that is, that is a really, really important tribute to the fact that people are listening to influencers and people they trust and, believe, and love and believe in versus the FDA that's got pharmaceuticals all the way in their wallets. So that's what's going on now is people are saying, no, I'm not going to listen to the FDA anymore. I'm listening to farmers. I'm listening to those that have experienced a, a, strong, and immune, a strong immune system. And I'm going to go farmers over pharmacies. And that's what's going on, guys. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say that because had I not listened to podcasters, farmers, even Reddit threads, I would still be on medication that was costing me $400,000 a year shitting blood versus being clinically healed in the best shape of my life. And I think why it's so important is that people that are putting out this information are actually sharing modalities of how they actually were able to heal themselves and sharing true science where conventional medicine is just like, nope, that's anecdotal. That doesn't fit within our peer reviewed exactly. the randomized control trials, et cetera. That's not science where real science is, is healing and taking all these different sources of, in, of information applying them and figuring out what works best for you, which is why the information you're talking about, Mark, is so important. Um, Mark, one of the questions I really wanted to ask you, because I think this is really important, I do think there might be a slight misconception or, around raw milk and the fact that the smaller the dairy is, it's a better indication of the fact that the milk is going to be really high quality and it's easier to keep clean. And I think why raw farm is so important is that you've proven that you can have the largest raw raw organic farm in the world and still have incredibly incredible quality of milk so i would just love to learn you know what things have you been doing over the years where you can continue to scale and also make incredible milk as you intended since like the 1990s when you took over the farm fantastic question <clears throat> we may be milking 1800 cows in two dairies but we treat those 1,800 cows like they're 20 cow dairies. Mm. That is the really key thing. And then, this is super important, Brett and, and Harry, we use extremely high standards that are not even in the same ballpark or even in the same Milky Way galaxy as the milk for pasteurization. So standards, standards matter. In California, we have a separate set of standards for raw milk versus pasteurization. At the Raw Milk Institute, we created something called the Common Standards, which is what's been applied around the world. We've trained farmers and 175 farmers in Great Britain uh, in, 80, 70, uh, in 2018. Uh, and we don't call it certifying, but we call it listing, where they actually get a public portal at the Raw Milk Institute website to show people how they apply those standards. So when milk is commingled together from 50 or 100 different dairies into one big silo tank, the number of pathogens are uncounted and they don't care because it's all going to get pasteurized. And the bacterial counts are astronomically high, too numerous to count. Let's put it that way. It's, it's, a, it's a miracle. It's not yogurt. Let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, it really is. And then when you look at our milk, very low, low bacteria count, still have the diversity, but because we chill the milk in two minutes versus in two hours. Now, some, some of the bigger dairies do chill it quickly. Yes, they do. But it's not required. So it's commingled with those dairies that don't. So you, you can take up to two hours or more to get the milk below 50 degrees. Our milk goes from 99 degrees, the body temperature of the cow, down to 36 degrees, three degrees above freezing in two minutes. Mm. So completely different standards, extremely clean bacteria uh, udders, very, very clean pathways, no biofilms, um, a lot of testing. We're spending a half million dollars a year on testing because we know that if a pathogen does get through, and there are some people out there with very compromised immune systems, they could get sick. And since I don't know everybody, 
that's consuming our products. They walk by and pick our, our milk up off the, of the store shelf at Erwan or Sprouts or Nugget Markets or Lassen's Markets. And they may be saying, you know what? I've got a really compromised immune system. I want to build it back better. Well, they're the ones that could get sick too, as they do build back better. So the bottom line is we are very in tune to the cutting edge of testing. And if you have one cow in 700 cows, let's say, and she's contributing a pathogen into that milk, you can't find her because that bacteria may be uh, hiding out in 6,000 gallons of milk. It's hard to find that pathogen at low levels. But if you test the cows in 20 cow composite sets, where you test those cows together every week, you actually eliminate the pathogen at the cow level before it even gets into the bulk tank. So that's the kind of pioneering we do to manage our herds at great expense because we're serving humanity, which comes in all walks, not those that have a robust, robust immune system. They could take a pathogen, who cares? We're talking about the ones that can't, that we want to build back their immune system so maybe they can in the future. So there's just all about the standards, man. It's the standards. It's what the, there's three things that the PubMed literature said about our standards. And there's two, two studies out done by international researchers that looked at the Raw Milk Institute and the data we, because every farmer that, that produces milk submits bacterial counts for their data every month or every week, sometimes every day. That data reveals that three things change the world for raw milk. One, completely separate and very intensive standards, number one. Number two, farmers training to assure they understand the standards and how to use them. And number three, routine testing to make sure you're actually in compliance with the standards. If you do those three things, your milk's a completely different product. So I would say it's much easier to handle a smaller operation. I agree. It is, no question about it. So a cow operation's got 5, 10, 15, 20 cows. You know those cows by name. You, you know everything going on with them. You know everything about them. If you're a knowledgeable farmer, that's pretty easy to manage, I would say. As, as, as your farmer gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you have to have more and more systems involved to track and understand each cow individually. And that's what we do, and we do it very well. But that doesn't mean that we're the best that somebody else are training and do testing once in a while. So uh, it's about we, guys. It's about all of us working together to feed humanity, not just us. Mark, you mentioned that you guys um, lower the temperature of the milk down to 36 degrees. Is there any effect on the enzymes in lowering the temperature or any of the, pro does it denature the protein at all? I'm no, curious. no. Yeah. And we know that because of all the studies done on breast milk banks that freeze their milk. Mm -hmm. uh, tremendous amount of studies been done on human milk, breast milk, and it has no effect. In fact, what's interesting about that is if you do take it out six to nine months, there is an effect. It's kind of an oxidation that occurs because it, it's um, the the ice crystals expand and push onto the butterfat globules, and there's an oxygen that sits there at low temperatures. However, in the 30 to 60 day range, literally nothing can be measurably different. It's very very similar. Bioactivity is there, bioactives are there, bioavailability is there, vitamins are there, uh, bacteria is there, enzymes are fully active. Uh, you got to remember we create life through frozen eggs and sperm. So really. Uh, free, freezing is pretty uh, benign of all the treatments. It's certainly absolutely benign in terms of bringing, bringing and we have a lot of customers for the last 15 years that have been uh, buying boatloads of our milk and freezing it and then thawing one a week or two a week or three a week as needed because they didn't want to drive long distances. So I would say freezing, especially when it's done rapidly, is very, very good. Mm. Mark, when I was um, when I was living in California and consuming a bunch of your product, my favorite way to start off my day was I would take a nice cup of black coffee. I would throw your raw cream in there, which is like so rich and has the perfect consistency. And I would take collagen protein and I would blend it up together. And it was like the perfect morning beverage. Um, is there anything about heating up the milk or the cream to high levels that affects the protein or the nutrient content? Let's think that for a second. Let's say you've got coffee. That coffee is 130 degrees. I don't know. I'm just picking a number here. Um, as you pour the cream into that coffee, the cream is cold the coffee temperature drops. So the first cream that actually entered the coffee is probably gonna have some denaturing that occurs. But the last cream that goes in and the temperature changes is not gonna have any effect at all. So it's a combination effect. It all has to do with heating. Um, remember enzymes change at different temperatures 
uh, for every enzyme. So some enzymes start to change at 115 degrees Fahrenheit. Other ones are changed at 130, 140, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Other ones 150. Uh, the lowest temp pasteurization is 145 degrees for 30 minutes. And not all enzymes are denatured, just key ones are, in, uh, are, are denatured. The raw whey protein is denatured. So I would say that uh, in doing the coffee thing, uh, you're, you're having minimal effect, maybe slight, but overall you're getting a lot of those bioactives still in, in, in powered, still engaged, uh, mm -hmm. it's still functional with at least some of that. Now, if it's super hot coffee, and let's say you do a cappuccino where it's really broiled, yeah, you're losing it all. That's why you need to have a raw milk kefir smoothie to go with that. So enjoy your cappuccino, but then have a uh, a smoothie that's got lots of of uh, uh, blueberries and strawberries. And when you put the strawberry in there, leave the top on it. The green mm -hmm. top is filled with all kinds of wonderful minerals uh, and vitamins. And, and and a raw egg and uh, meat proteins and colostrum uh, stuff and um, avocado and put some raw honey in there and raw milk kefir, all that stuff together, even some leafy greens if you want. Blend that all up. It's gonna have a little bit of sweetness to it. It's gonna be incredibly nutrient dense, extremely bioavailable. And you're not gonna have any kind of hunger pains for about six hours. Mm. And you're gonna have your gut is gonna be happy, happy with antioxidants and bioactives and raw fats and everything all good to go. And so people that really want to heal their gut with Crohn's and, and have gut inflammation problems will make themselves a designer smoothie that has raw milk kefir, an avocado, a raw egg, lots of berries, antioxidant berries, uh, add, add fiber and stuff, maybe some colostrum stuff, maybe some meat protein, raw meat protein stuff. Dr. Sal Paul Saladino has it, stuff that you guys are making, all that stuff. Put that in there all together, plus any other things you want, some raw maybe some uh, raw honey. I would not use any kind of fake sweeteners ever in your life. They're terrible, terrible for your brain and your, and your gut. Um, and you've got yourself, maybe throw some kale in there or, 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 or whatever, a spinach. And you blend it all together. The flavors of the kefir and the berries are going to supersede everything. And the raw honey is going to give it a little bit of a, of a nice flavor in terms of sweetness. Not a lot, but some. And you're going to have something that's fantastic for your gut. And that's what people are using to literally uh, decrease inflammation in the gut and get rid of the ulceration from Crohn's. And I tell you what, that's a superfood. And you really don't need much more than that for breakfast. You really don't. Mm. I was going to say to your point, Mark, I remember when I was reading the untold story of milk, because Harry had bought us two copies about two years ago. <clears throat> I don't remember the gentleman's name, but one of the co-founders of the Mayo Clinic was taking patients almost a hundred years ago that had Crohn's and colitis and putting them on these raw milk fasts and they were decreasing their inflammation levels and like medically curing themselves of something that's deemed uncurable. I thought I had that book behind me someplace right here. Uh, the Milk Cure, Chronic Disease, yes. Dr. Porter. Mm, Porter. That was it, that, yeah. Yep, and they would use raw milk from certified Dairies, the AAMMC, the Dr. Coit uh, work that he did in 1893, which was available all through the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And they would literally eliminate or reduce, I don't know that they cured everybody, but I'll tell you what, a tremendous number of people were healed by consuming raw milk only for 20, 30 days at a time. And remember, babies only consume raw milk. They don't even drink water. Um... And so it is a fantastic gut healing food because that's how it was designed by nature and God himself to start life. It was the only thing consumed by babies to build that strong, adaptive and res resilient immune system and gut microbiome. These are the gut microbiome formative foods, the raw fats, the proteins, the sugars, uh, all these enzymes, uh, uh, phenomenal. Uh, the, the fat itself, the globule, the globule, the butterfat globule itself is a fiber dense product it's got there's fiber there and the butyrate the butyrates the butyrates come from the the milk uh, fat globule membrane uh and so there's fiber there's actually fiber in the fat itself so it's a phenomenally incredible food and it was going to the mayo clinic to heal people why can't it go to the kaiser uh foundation or, or some clinic now and heal people why not boy wouldn't that be a lot cheaper let me tell you what, back in 2004,
there was a doctor at a local children's hospital, literally 25 miles north of us, who had a child who had acute problems in his gut. He had the local sheriff's department run code three lights and sirens to our dairy to get milk to get back to that kid. And from what we were told by the doctor, within a couple of hours, that child's gut crisis had come down. It had come down substantially from where it was. Just by getting a couple cups of this raw milk in their gut, it calmed. That is a doctor who knows what the hell they're doing. And I'm telling you, we need to have farmers over pharmacies. We cannot be reliant on, on pharmaceuticals, although I'm the first one to say we need that too. It's a hybrid of both. It's about 20% modern medicine and about 80% food, and you get the best outcome. Definitely. <laughs> but we need to start the food early in life so you don't need the 20%, right? Definitely. Yeah, it, it's it's um, it's such a good message, and, and I, I think it's hopeful, too, for anyone mm -hmm. listening. You know, I, I think it can be really do doom and gloom when you're thinking about the pharmaceutical industry and its growth and power and incentives and all the momentum behind it, but... At the end of the day, people, uh, I truly believe, you know, people have the motivation to be healthy and to thrive and to want to live an abundant life. And I think at the core of that, it's how do you feed yourself uh, nutritionally? And, you know, there's a lifestyle component to that as well. But really, a lot of it just starts with with diet and real foods. Um, well, I, Harry, I think you're absolutely correct. We have to be patient, but passionate. Totally. And so if you do patience and passionate, it means you consistently, persistently teach, teach, teach. And because we're teaching the truth here, we're not teaching some phony, weird, fake crap. We're talking about serious stuff that makes big differences. And when you get a, a kind of a, a level of market penetration where people are dollar voting, they're saying, no, nah, I'm not doing the drugs, I'm doing the food. And you start to veer, that guiding hand becomes incredibly powerful, especially in America here, where you're choosing health through gut microbiome nourishing foods, and you're avoiding the other drugs and reducing it over time. That is absolutely non-confusing to anybody what's going to go on, because you're going to get a force of nature happening in the marketplace, which demands this. And you're going to have more and more farmers doing it. You have better, better training for farmers. You're going to have and eventually you actually have regulatory change because the people want it. They're buying it. They're supporting it. They're, that's happened to a certain extent here in California, where mm -hmm. we're now we're in 600 stores or so. Uh, and, 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 and we have five dairies a day failing in America and a dairy a week in California that are the pasteurized guys. They're dying. And it's terrible because they're doing a great job what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But nobody's wanting their products at the levels they were before. And so pasteurization is going to be here for a long time because you know, people want cheap food and, and you've got the regulatory thing. You've got cheeses that are going to get cooked on top of pizzas. They don't need to be raw. There's all kinds of stuff going on there. But at the same time, you're going to see a continued evolution and growth of raw by dollar voting. And so the consumers themselves can be self-determinate in their futures by simply where they put their dollars. So if a consumer is going to go out and buy sustainable food and support that farmer and it makes a life change to them and they measure it and see it in their own children and they tell other families and they tell other families and that farmer and other farmers start doing it more, you start seeing evolution. You start seeing change from the grassroots up. Mm -hmm. And that's the strongest kind. Because it doesn't matter what the FDA says. They could say, the sky's falling on your head. They say, bring it on, I don't care. Because... The truth is relevant in their lives. Mm. And so that the truth is always going to come out over time. Unfortunately, it's just taking a tremendous toll on us as we endure the lies, as we endure these symptom relievers, these uh, turn off the warning lights as your engine blows up kind of food, right? Yes. Um, so it's all about empowerment of people through education and having farmers that are well-trained that can supply that product to people so they can make that choice. I will say one thing that's really cool to me that I think gives a lot of hope, Delaware, highly illegal to produce raw milk forever. Delaware just changed their laws that the actual legislation is before the governor uh, right now. It's all passed their Senate 39 to two. Wow. Uh, and so they, they worked with us the last nine months 
to educate the legislature and put forward the promise of, of what could be possible for Delaware to have world-class raw milk in Delaware. Instead of people driving four hours down to Pennsylvania to be, uh, pick up raw milk from the Amish and come back, they're going to have their own product. And by the way, I have to give tremendous credit to Michael uh, Skuse, who's the Secretary of Agriculture, who came out in support of raw milk. He said, let's bring world-class raw milk here. Let's have on-farm labs at every farm so farmers can measure their own bacterial counts and know what they're doing, just like the AAMMC. And he followed the Raw Milk Institute standards. So we're really, really excited about the promise of the future for Delaware. But that could also be the model. That could be the uh, perfect example of what could happen in other places where people have become aware that their citizens deserve to be connected to their farmers locally. Mark, do you think... Does it? Do you agree with the fact that raw milk is a state by state issue, or do you think this is something that should be federal? That's a great question. Um, in a perfect world, it would be regulated federally, but locally, actually, the testing would be done locally. But you know, I spent five hours with Nicole Shanahan, who's the vice presidential can candidate with um, RFK, mm -hmm. here at our farm about two weeks ago. She was here with the news crew and everything. She had her security team. It was amazing. That's incredible. And she said, I want within five years, half of America drinking raw milk because we cannot afford the medical paradigm we have going forward for everybody. It's bankrupting us. So if you had passion at the highest levels of our government, you wouldn't just have Senator Matt Massey. You'd have Congressman Massey. You'd have the FDA saying, you're going to change your, your, your position or we're going to get rid of you. Um, then you would have paradigm shift pretty quickly. But I'm telling you, that is a tsunami effect. That is a major category seven hurricane for America in terms of the medical paradigm and the dairy paradigm and who has power and who, who's been pressing what in policy issues. So for now, I'm not suggesting that. I think that's kind of an impossible dream, kind of almost a horror story. It's kind of a crazy thing. Um, mm -hmm. What I would suggest is con con continue the grassroots absolute foundation building from the farmers up to the consumers and let that be absolutely non-erodible that it's it's non it's 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 just built strong from the ground up and at some point there will be a breaking point somebody in the admin is going to say this makes sense i'm on raw milk myself i love it it's been great for my kids why shouldn't everybody have it but i think that's going to be another generation or two before that occurs but it's happening now and i forespeak this i say it now because I experience it at the foundational level. It will happen. It's already happening. Mm. Um, it's just a matter of time. And I believe that the speed of technology, I mean, Steve Jobs gave us, gave us an interesting little tool with our iPhones here. The speed of technology, the ability to identify a pathogen on the farm is happening. And we're able to do it quickly, rapidly, and accurately. So you get data in two hours or three hours versus 36 or 48 hours off farm at extreme expense. So you can have pathogen-free milk at a very low risk thing on the farm, you've built a tremendous amount of value added for the farmer themselves. And I, I think that that is the kind of the next wave of the speed of rapid, accurate testing of pathogens on farm is a technological thing that will happen, which will trigger this. And it's already happening. We're already doing it on our farm. Mm -hmm. Makes you wonder, maybe that maybe that would be uh, Biden's secret during the debates is get him some raw milk and raw cream, turn the lights back on, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love Biden. Great man. I think his heart's the right place. I think he's got one thing off, and that's the Gaza policy. He has not been aggressive enough there. He needs to turn that switch off and have peace. I'm a humanitarian. I've always been. Um, and so peace is a wonderful international trade policy because when people are at peace, they trade. They're not in fear and protection and spending all their money on military things. So uh, I, I hope, I wish the best to Biden, but I do I believe that, yeah, his brain and gut would work better if he was on Ramal for sure. It's a little old to change that old cat. Um, I, I, I certainly I have no support whatsoever for Trump. I think he's a madman. Uh, but that's just me speaking from my heart. Uh, we serve all, feed all, and and feed you know love all, and we would serve everyone equally in a room. But at the same time, I think that, that there's a better outcome for decision making when your gut microbiome is working with your brain, the gut the gut brain connection, the axis. Um, you, so, you see a lot less crime, you see a lot less ADD, you see a lot less everything. Kids are doing better in schools. Uh, it's just going to be a much better paradigm when people are nourished in their gut first and the brain's going to work a lot better. Mm -hmm. Mark, to that point, what do, what do you think when you, because I've seen some news articles recently talking about raw milk being associated with some other extremist movements. 
Yes. Uh, what, what do you think about the politicalization of raw milk um, to that extent? <laughs> or, you know, it's getting at, identified with different ideologies that- sure. I think the, the studies have been pretty interesting about that. And I think it goes down to the, the local level. Mm. When you uh, are in California, it's not associated with ideology at all. We got left, right, middle, everybody drinking raw milk. No big deal. It's not associated with left or right. But you go to a state where raw milk is heavily suppressed and you are kind of a rebel, let's say on the right wing, let's say you're right wing. Um, and you're saying, how dare you suppress my freedoms? You're going to associate raw milk with freedom. And I get that 100%. And they're going to champion that. It happened in Delaware quite a bit. But we also get, we got a lot of, of, uh, of bipartisan support 100% because they realized it wasn't about whether you're left or right or red or, or, or blue. It was about whether you have kids or not. <laughs> you know? And so it's interesting that where those areas where you have the, the least amount of freedoms, you'll see the right wing really championing it as a freedom issue. But when you have raw milk is kind of available to everybody, it's not a left or right issue at all. It is a human right. It is a, a nutritional right issue. And so um, I do see it being reflected in the media. And I think that media is writing about the local story about how somebody in the right wing picked you up and championed, it, championed raw milk. I haven't seen Trump come out and advocate for raw milk at all. Um, he's drinking his Diet Pepsi or whatever he's drinking. So mm -hmm. I, 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 don't, I don't get that really as a pure thought in terms of right versus left. But I do understand, and I do agree that it has been written about as a, um, a partisan issue where you have freedoms that are suppressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because you'd mentioned um, RFK's VP coming out to meet with you for multiple hours. I saw a video, some promotional video for him where he was talking about chronic disease and this, you know, kind of like the, the monopoly of the food system. He was talking about it for multiple minutes in this promo video where he was right. talking about all these different issues. I know he's been out to White Oak Pastures before. It's really right. cool to see a candidate that's addressing these fundamental levels with our food system so um, so closely. It's pretty, it's pretty incredible. And it's going to be interesting to see with these, these younger crops of candidates that are more plugged in, you know, seeing this become more of a political issue, because this really should transcend both lines of the political spectrum. It should. And I, I personally, if I was going to say anything to RFK right now, would be, if you would be a pro-peace in Gaza, stop firing bullets there immediately, he'd pick up the Muslim vote. Hmm. And his whole entire platform on nutrition is rock solid, fantastic. I love it. I love it. He would do so much better than he currently is. Uh, so, he needs to differentiate himself from both, um, you know, current, you know, candidates, Biden and Trump. And he could do that by by doing something that's really pro-peace. In my opinion, I think that would really work well for him. But I don't know why he hasn't done that yet, but he should. Mm -hmm. Mark, one of the things I wanted to ask you is that I saw a statistic that Raw Farm currently feeds 50,000 Cal California families, which is such an incredible statistic. And then you think about all the raw dairy farmers that you've trained, the number that kind of stems back to you is probably in the millions, which is so unbelievable to think about the nourishment that's coming from these practices. What is that feeling actually like knowing that you're making a dent and a difference in this thing that seems so overwhelming and actually proving that we can win this war in, in terms of food sovereignty and nourishing our community? Well, when you're in a battle, you, you, tend, you tend not to know what it's going to look like after the battle. You just kind of feel like you're in the battle. And I, I think I'm kind of there a little bit, but I've immersed myself so much in the educational side of this that um, I do feel really, really good about all these reported uh, cases of, of improved uh, illness or improved uh, health with our foods. So I'm just getting a sense of what it is like after the battle a little bit now, which is wonderful. But I, I think that um, educating has been one of the greatest things for me to keep my heart straight was when you teach people and they come back and say, you know, you told me two and a half to three years ago, and now I'm having a different life because of it. I feel very sustained by that. So um, again, uh, we got the truth in the moms. They may have the gun, the guns and the money, but the truth in the moms are so important because you can live by those things. The mom that comes to our, our on-farm store here and buys our product and tells me a story about how fantastic her kids are doing and gives a big, big hug and tears in her eyes, that drives you at a deeper humanity level. Mm. It allows you to do things that are very brave because you know who you're working for. You know who you're representing. Um, we've had FDA 
inspectors at our farm for weeks at a time. And I've given them a head trip on raw milk. I've te- I showed them all the archived information at their own website about raw milk and breast milk and all this kind of stuff. And I, I really do think I changed their minds about why I fight like I fight and why I'm educating like I'm educating. So I send weakness back into their foundations for the fact that they have self-reflection on what they're actually doing to themselves and for themselves and by themselves. Um, I, I, I don't know that there's just, like I said, a stickiness to the paradigm where, where people tend to stay with what they know and they don't like to change. And the change means you have to admit to something that wasn't right. Hmm. And that takes flexibility in your mind. It takes an open mind. It takes an open heart. And that's why we generally don't teach raw milk. I mean, I sell raw milk. We don't go out and sell, buy, buy, buy raw milk. We never say buy raw No, I never. I say, that's your choice. What we do is we teach about your immune system so you can make an intelligent, informed choice yourself. And that's really empowering to people. And I think that that has caused, like you said, a ripple effect where we've had a multiplier effect. I realized back in 2010, 15, 12, 14, 15 years ago, that we will not emerge as a brand ourselves unless all boats, all boats were floating in the harbor, all uh, the tide raised all boats, raised all boats. So reaching out to train what people might argue is my competition was super important to me because I wanted all raw, raw milk to be a good experience. And so development of standards for raw milk and training farmers, farmers unselfishly was one of the greatest things we've ever done for our own brand mm. because we share customers. People that might visit your dairy in Texas or some other place, they come here and they drink raw milk, my raw milk, and they have a good experience. Well, they go back to Texas. They want that same experience. So I'm not going to feed everybody. I don't want to feed everybody. I want to feed those that, that are nearby me, that are local to me. And I want farmers to feed their local farmers. So I'm not sure if it's local as far as state by state is concerned. Um, I do know that our raw pet food is being distributed nationally as we speak. Uh, it's for animal uh, consumption only, and I will not speak about that uh, at all. It comes off the exact same production line, and we it is it is labeled ex- ex- only for pet food consumption. That's an FDA thing we have to comply with, so I'll leave that alone. But the bottom line is, the more we can have local food feed local uh, consumers, the more resilient we'll be as a food system. During COVID, our our farmer friends were dumping milk in their lagoons because their processors couldn't take the milk because schools were shut down, institutional sales were shut down and all they had was stores. So 30% of their their product sales were gone and they couldn't retool with new palletizing and labeling and whatever they had to do to go to the stores only. And for 90 days, when we'd show up at the stores, because we adapted immediately when COVID hit in February, March of 2020, they would say, just leave everything you can on the shelves and take the entire shelf. Don't worry about skew space because you're no, no pasteurized milk is going to be here for 30 days. We found that to be real here in California. And we had people picking up our milk that had never drank raw milk. And they called us the farm saying, I see this really expensive milk here. Uh, what's it do? And we explained to them. So we had an educational opportunity. And plus, we were able to be resilient. We weren't dumping milk in lagoons. We were short on milk. We had to stop making cheese and make milk because the stores demanded it immediately. It said, come back two or three times a week and fill the shelves because there's nobody else there. So during a food crisis, whether you like what happened in 2020 or not, it was a crisis. We were res- we were res- feeding our local communities better than anybody because we were adaptive and resilient. So during the stress test of 2020, we thrived. When other dairies that were in this big monopoly consolidated mess died. Uh, so there's just so much proof here to look at. It's just amazing. Hmm. Well, Mark, I know you don't need to hear this, but we just truly appreciate what you're doing. Um, you know, from our perspective and just knowledge of raw milk, what you're doing is truly a humanitarian effort. It's hmm. not just some clickbaity raw milk is great for you uh, thing that, you know, a lot of, I think, influencers have done a great job popularizing raw milk, but like you are doing the true God's honest work and educating and providing the product. So um, we're just so thankful that there are people like you out there. Um, You guys, you are a source of inspiration for Brett and myself. um, And I just want to give you a word of encouragement to keep going because your work is incredible. And just, um, yeah, we're so appreciative. I, I believe that what would Jesus say 
what would Jesus do? And what would Jesus eat? Mm -hmm. Three things to really think about in your mind. What would he say? What would he do? And what would he eat? I think he would do what we're doing. I think he'd say what we're saying. And I think he would eat what we're, what we're suggesting here was whole unprocessed foods. Mm -hmm. And so that's financial. I don't care what religion you're coming from. Those are guidances for life. And uh, Muslims, uh, Hindus, I don't care who you are. You're going to have those kinds of deep guidances. And I, I, I live and breathe that every day. Hmm. I don't think there's a better possible moment to close out the podcast with that. And the Bible does mention milk 48 times. I did a little research. <laughs> but um, That was raw milk. milk. That was raw milk, by the way. That was raw milk. Yeah. <laughs> Back when it was just milk. There was no raw. There was no regenerative farming. It was just, it was just, <laughs> but um. But yeah, that was raw. That was raw honey, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mark, thank you so much, man. It's been great to meet you virtually. We're very excited to come out to the farm soon and get to meet you in person and build a relationship. And um, I'm just really excited to see where this whole thing leads, man. So thank well, you. You're so extremely welcome to come out. And we would love for you to come out because, like, like I said, my heart, my mind, my soul is all dedicated to education. And you guys are doing a fantastic job of that. So good job. Meat Mafia. Milk <laughs> <Nope>, Mafia. Nope. <laughs>